Hello and welcome to Active Bryant Fitness Systems and this video is all about how to do the job that you love becoming a personal fitness trainer, health coach or coach. Now I've been doing it for over 25 years and I'm going to give you 10 reasons or 10 things that can add to your personal training career if you're just starting and you're new to it. So some of the pitfalls I've made myself, so I'm gonna be talking from experience, I'm gonna be talking about, so let's go over it. We're gonna talk about education and certificates. Then we're gonna talk about gaining experience. Then we're gonna talk about what are your reasons for becoming a PT? Most people wanna do it for the money and not for the joy and the love like I do it for. Uh, pros and cons of being a PT the books you can read to enhance your knowledge, uh, what are the best gyms to work at as a PT, should you be self-employed or employed, uh, self-employed or employed, and how to make money as a PT, uh, which can be quite tough. Okay, so let's talk about the first thing, which is uh, education and certificates, right. There's 101 different courses that you can do and the whole market is saturated because they realise that uh, many guys and girls want to do a job that they love. And most guys and girls that go to the gym on a regular basis may be thinking about becoming a PT and thinking, oh, this is a, a great job I should do. And I can say hand on heart, 25 years on, it is the best job I've ever done. Even though you've got the split shifts, you've got the backstabbing, you've got the extortionate rents, you've got uh, people that are really busy that are not maybe as good as you from what you've studied and stuff. And then you've got uh, managers who get jealous of you because you're busier than them and making more money than them, than them as a freelance PT. And this happens all the time. OK, so let's talk about education. So with there being 101 different courses out there, which one is really the best? Now, I've studied with the Czech Institute and I've become a Paul Czech Master Practitioner that took me six years to get. And it was hard work, lots of money, lots of reading, lots of case histories, lots of hands-on experience I had to get with different clients about adjusting the atlas, releasing diaphragms, how to do a proper functional postural assessment, how to do orthopedic assessments and how to uh, look for adrenal fatigue, fungal infections and uh, ego issues in clients as well as uh, dietary issues. So the fitness industry wants to make you think it's just about diet and exercise, but it that is complete bullshit. It's more, it's much, much, much more in depth than that. If you want to keep long-term clients so and charge a lot of money so you can look online you can do an online course but if you do an online course you're never going to have palpation skills or be able to touch the person unless you decide that you're going to go out and do stuff from what you've learned online now for me i know that the bigger percentage of personal trainers and fitness coaches have a learning difficulty like dyslexia or something like that and we're really good at watching the body and seeing what's going on and thinking about what muscle's working, which muscle's not working, what muscle is long, what muscle is, is tight, and uh, what muscle is facilitated, and what muscle uh, is full of trigger points. Does that make sense? But that's only, in my opinion, if you've done lots of extra courses like I have. I've done over 40 different courses in which to make sure that I keep my knowledge up to date and advanced of my competition. Does that make sense? And that's why I charge more than my competition in an hourly rate. Because a client's paying for my expertise and skill, okay? So building your knowledge is really important. So I've read a thousand books on fitness, diet, lifestyle, spirituality, and lots of other different subjects. <laughs> and I believe that knowledge is power only used in the correct way. So building your knowledge base is really important as well as working with all different types of clients. 
So I've worked with bodybuilders. I've worked with people, uh, tennis players. I've worked with golfers. I've worked with dancers. I've worked with photographers. I've worked with movie stars, actresses, actors, uh, models. I've worked with such a big array of people because my music is like my clients, as in I like all different types of music. So I'm attracted to all different types of clients. And as a, when you're running a self-employed business, you can't really turn anyone down unless you have a personality clash. And that's happened to me a few times, but I'll talk about more in that later. So building your knowledge base is really, really important. And now they're saying in the science that your optimum learning window is 20 minutes. So you should read a book for 20 minutes or watch something or listen to something that's educational for 20 minutes every day. <laughs> and if you do it on a specific subject like back pain, fat loss or uh, how to hit the ball further for golf, you will have more knowledge than the average person because you've spent five years studying that area. Does that make sense? So you become a master in your field and you can call yourself a master as long as you've done your 10,000 hours. And obviously I've done 25 years of PT in people. That's more than 10,000 hours. So I'm more than a master. Big ego. <laughs> uh, so really important for you to get your knowledge base up there. Then you've got to think about number four is uh, why do you want to be a PT? And what are you willing to put in to becoming the best PT that you can? So I've spent over £60,000 on books, courses, uh, studying and hours and hours of doing online research as well as doing research on PubMed and places like that in which to make sure that my knowledge is outstanding. Does that make sense? And as a uh, PT, the thing that I love about it is that the science keeps changing, but some of the science is bought and paid for to sell you a product. So that means it's not real science. So when you're looking at science, like I got taught by a successful physio that said to me, Scott, when you're looking at the science, you've got to look at how many people have been in that study. So one doctor brought out a study about flexibility. You don't need to stretch before you train and you don't need to train afters. That's complete bollocks. He'd done it on himself, one person. And he didn't do the stretching for eight to 12 weeks to see what the improvement was. Does that make sense? And some people don't need to stretch because they're hypermobile. And that's something that you can learn about, you know, as you decide to go deeper in the world of personal training and learning more and more stuff. And this is what I like about the Czech Institute study program. It's six years or five years and they don't give you the certificates easily. They're really hard to get. You have to get 85 to 95 uh, percent to get a pass mark to get your certificates. Does that make sense? Or to get passed by Paul himself if you reach level five, like, like I did uh, 14 years ago. So really, really important that if you think that you can do one course and be one trick pony, you won't last long in the industry and you certainly won't be in it as long as me. Does that make sense? 25 years. Wow. OK, so your purpose for being a PT. You've got to think about. So I love helping people get out of pain, get stronger, get leaner, get faster. Or maybe they just want to be able to walk a bit better. Or maybe they want to get up in the morning with no lower back pain. Or maybe they're getting ready for a big competition and they want superb posture. Or maybe they're just not hitting the ball for their tennis or their golf like they used to. Does that make sense? That's what motivates me. Yes, I get paid a lot of money. But I want to see the result. And if the client starts self-sabotaging, not turning up, I fire them, I get rid of them because it's just a waste of time. Does that make sense? And some clients don't understand that. They think I should just keep taking their money just for the sake of it. But then that means I become a prostitute. Does that make sense? Just taking their money for the sake of it. Whereas I want to be taking their money because I'm getting awesome results and putting their money up because I'm getting awesome results. So it's really, really important. 
So the cons of being a PT are very long hours from six in the morning. I don't do six in the morning. I do nine in the morning, but six in the morning till eight, nine o'clock at night. By the time you travel to get home, then you've got to unwind yourself to get ready for sleep. Does that make sense? So normally I work from nine till about seven, eight thirty. I won't do lates anymore because I feel that with my knowledge and understanding adrenal fatigue and how you can get chronically tired as a PT very, very quickly, I don't want to go through that. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes a client can only train late at night. So I trained a doctor for 25 years and he would turn up late to sessions or come later for sessions because he was doing surgery or looking after clients and he's self-employed the same as me. So he can't afford to say, uh, right, I finish at five o'clock. Does that make sense? So the pros of being a PT is really good money if you're not being ripped off by the gym and you're allowed to charge what you want to charge and you've got confidence to charge a lot of money. Uh, being in shape yourself, keeping yourself in shape, not like James Smith, and uh, just learning about the body. I find it highly fascinating that the body is more complex than a car engine. So when I hear PTs say to me, uh, oh yeah, I don't need to do any more study and I, I, you know, I know a lot of stuff. I know that they're fucking complete liars because a doctor can do a six year degree and he still don't know it all. Does that make sense? Or somebody can do a PhD, which is a high standard in education, or a scientist, and they're still learning new stuff. So you can see where sometimes in the fitness industry, you'll talk to other PTs like I do, and they can be very arrogant and very ignorant. Very arrogant and very ignorant. And if you want to be successful getting new clients and stuff, you don't want to be arrogant and you don't want to be ignorant. You want to be highly knowledgeable and uh, let your client know that you're the boss when it comes to training them. Because some clients will try and have, you know, constant long debates about stuff they know fuck all about. And I've had that as well. Uh, so, so pros and cons of being a PT. Books you can read, just a couple. Uh, Pavlo, Power to the People. Next one, Applied Strongman Training by Charles Parlequin. Excellent, excellent book. Modern strengths of strength training and uh, Czech's book. I don't know if you can still get it. Marks for success. So that's just uh, four books of my over a thousand books uh, just to get you started. So when reading a book, I got told a really good tip by my uh, mentor. And uh, that's another thing you need to get is a mentor. If you really want to be hugely successful is that uh, you can click the link below to book me, but I'm very expensive. Uh, right, so to read a book, some books can be a 1,000 pages, some books can be 25 pages. And the way to read a book or to speed read is to look down the index, find the subject you want to learn on or learn about, highlight it, go to that page, put a like, sticker at the top, and then highlight it with a highlighter pen, or don't highlight it if you don't want to damage the book. And then use your finger to read. So you're reading when using your finger. And this is a form of speed reading. So you don't necessarily have to read a thousand pages of that book. There could be only five golden nuggets in that book in five pages. And this is the way that you can learn it. Or you can do audio book, or what I've learned recently, or a while ago, you, you could do a photo with your iPhone and get the phone to speak back the page to you. So it's super, super quick to learn with the iPhone there. And I do this on a regular basis and on my Mac as well. I only use a Mac. I don't use PC Windows and all that bollocks. OK, so the next thing. What is the best gym to work in London? Now, the best gyms are really are freelance studios for personal trainers if you're self-employed. Now, if you're working for a big chain like Fitness First, The Third Space, Pure Gym and all gyms like that, unless you're solidly booked and your rate is very high, 
you will be on less than minimum wage. And some of them even have the cheek, if you're paying them a rent, to ask you to clean the machines and clean the toilets and do all these other, other jobs. What a fucking joke. How can you clean the machines and keep the gym clean if you're a PT training clients? The client will see you as jack of all trades and master of none and see you as a fucking cleaner, not as a coach, not as a fitness person. They'll just see you as a cleaner. Now, I went into Pure Gym just to check out their gym and to have a workout locally. And I hated, I liked the gym equipment. I liked uh, how the gym was set out. But there were so many Neanderthals in there. And as soon as I walked in the door, the cleaner come up to me. That She started chatting to me, showing me around. And then she went, oh, well, you can book me for PT if you like. You can have a PT session with me if you like. You can have a free PT session with me. So desperate to get me as a client, it was unbelievable, without her even checking out my background. She didn't say, oh, how long have you been training for, Scott? Oh, you've got nice 18-inch arms. How long have you been training and uh, uh, what sort of workout are you doing today? Do you see my point? So I never booked, never booked her and never uh, joined the gym because I had this pod to get in and out of the gym. And then what happened was the, the fire alarm went off and there was a queue to get through the pod so you could get burnt to death. So uh, I decided not to join. So the next thing, so really being self-employed is definitely the harder route because you're choosing your own hours, you're getting your own clients and... Uh, even in the PT studios, you're going to get backbiting, backstabbing and all that bullshit, unfortunately, unless you've got your own studio. But having your own studio has huge cost. And from what I've seen in London and over the years, the PTs don't charge enough. They like got their own studio and they're charging 50 quid an hour. And I'm like, wait a minute, if you only do four hours a, uh, a day, you've earned 200 quid. But your rent at the end of the month with business rates and all the other things you've got to pay is uh, two grand. And that's how they set themselves up for failure. Does that make sense? And renting out your own space. That's the other thing that some trainers let their ego get in the way too much of that. Oh, I'm not letting you use my gym, even though we've been friends for 10 years. I'm using that as an example. And so that means if got free space that's dead and empty and not making any money at 12 o'clock, at 1 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, at 3 o'clock. But 4, 5 and 6, it's busy with him training his own clients. Does that make sense? So really important, don't make that mistake. Don't let your ego get in the way of you renting out your space. So really, you know, be, being a self-employed or employed trainer... The good thing about being an employee trainer is that you'll get financial security. But from what I can see online, they're only charged, they're only paying 20 grand a year or 30 grand a year. But you only get the 30 grand a year when you're doing PT sessions for them where they're charging 150 and you're getting £12.50. Is, is, is that right? It's not right, is it? So uh, it's really important that being self-employed, always be up on your tax, your national insurance and all the things that you need to pay to the government so you never get behind. And remember, when you're self-employed, clothes can go against your tax liability. If you're working from home, which I do as well, your internet, your PC or your Mac or your papers or your council tax and your gas and electric can all go against your tax. Does that make sense? Which is absolutely fantastic. And remember, I think it's about £12,500 that you can earn before you pay any tax. And remember that if you earn £20,000, but your expenses are £10,000, 
you still pay no tax, but you, you'll pay a little bit of national insurance. Does that make sense? Because the threshold for national insurance is uh, six grand, I think. If you earn over six grand, then you have to pay a bit towards national insurance to have a NHS that doesn't work and not get a pension when you're 71, you know? Uh, so employed or self-employed. So employed, you'll get holiday pay, you'll get sick pay, you'll be paid less, they'll be able to tell you what to do all the time. Uh, when I work, I used to work for the Hurlingham Club. No, yes, I did work for the Hurlingham Club. I've done some lectures there. But the main club that I worked at when I very first started was called... Uh, Fucking hell, what's the name of it? I can't remember the name of it, but there was a, a club that I worked at in central London, which was a private members club, and it had a hotel on it. And I worked there for six months, and for six months, it was so dead, I was reading my manuals and studying for the, the Czech stuff that I was studying, having the dream that I was going to get out of this predicament and uh, move on, you know? And I did. Uh, so there's prestige gyms that you can work at, like the Third Space. But what the Third Space do, they employ really young people to get you to do their courses. They get you locked into a contract where you're not going to leave, otherwise they'll charge you for the course that you did. And the course at the Third Space won't be recognised by anybody else. So you're really wasting your time. Does that make sense, in my opinion? So the number 10 is uh, how to make money as a PT. Online training, one-to-one -one personal training, group personal training, build somebody's gym, charge them for your time. Assessments, programs, which nobody ever does programs. I do a program for all my clients and they're always charged. Uh, online training, okay? You could do holiday training. You could write a book. I've written my own book, Holistic Health for Proper Geezers, Classy Ladies, Get the Body and Fitness You Want Now. Uh, you can buy it. And if you buy the book, you give me a review. And uh, once you've done this and you tell me the code in the book, I will design you a free program. And my programs are now put up to £200 a program because I get awesome results with my programs. So you've got all them avenues to make money. But what you've got to remember is that in my local area, I've got 27 trainers I'm competing with. And remember, when you're in the gym, say you're working for a gym where you're paying a rent, you might have 10 trainers that you're competing with. But I think that's changed now because of the pandemic and because of the technical recession that we're in. Most gyms have only got one, two or three personal trainers because the trainers are realising, right, I've got to pay a £1,000 a month rent to the gym and I've got to pay maybe seven, eight £800 mortgage or rent and I've got to pay for my car and I've got to pay for my food and I've got to pay for all my other bills and the customers or PT clients only want to pay £50 an hour. Can you see where you can't work as a PT in a gym where you pay huge rent. Yes, the rent is offset off against your tax, but only a percentage of it, not all of it. Same with the council tax, it's only a percentage is set off against your council tax or your gas and electric bills at home or the new floor that you buy for your home gym. Only a percentage of it goes against your tax because they want you to pay tax. Does that make sense? But the way I look about paying tax the more tax anybody pays, the more successful you are. So don't see it as a negative, see it as a positive. But the other thing that you're up against is that if you're self-employed in the gym, you can come and go as you please, but the clients will dictate what time they want to train. Unless you're strong like me, I only work from this time to this time. So I recently had a client that kept wanting to train at 9.45 or 9.30. No, I can't do that because all my clients train on the hour. And for me, for me to get it in my head to make sure my diary is clear or not one after the other, but I'll do two, then I have a two hour break, another two, do a two hour break. It works well in my head for that to work that way. 
But by doing 45 minutes, I end up staying an extra 25 minutes because the client's talking and I'm not going to be rude and go, shut the fuck up, I need to go now. Does that make sense? So you've got to look for these little pitfalls like uh, never ever sign anyone up for 20 sessions. Always three, three months, six months to 12 months because you'll have that income that will cover all your bills. Whereas if you're asking each client for for a 10 payment or a 20 payment, that's nearly at the end of every month, you're asking them for money again. And I don't like doing that. I'd rather have the three months, six months up front or 12 months because then I know they're committed, they're going to do it, they're going to turn up, they're going to be you know, a really good client. So I can put all my energy, all my time and all my effort into helping that client. Does that make sense? Whereas if you do 10 sessions or five sessions, say it's 50 quid an hour and it's 10 sessions, you're only making 500 pounds. But your rent is a thousand pounds with your home rent as well. So if you have one client to start off with, you're not even going to pay your bills. Does that make sense? And obviously I feel from my 25 years of experience, if they sign up for 10 sessions, they're not even committed. So why would you want to work with them? Because there is a thing that many clients suffer with, which is self-sabotage. And when they've got that self-sabotage bug, no matter what you do, they won't turn up. They'll cancel. Always charge for cancellations. Unless it's a client that you've been working with for years and you built a rapport together. And what I say to clients, look, if you're not going to turn up today, you owe me a dinner at the Ivy. So the Ivy is probably £90 a head. All right, Scott, I'll take you out for dinner. Does that make sense? So then that way you're still getting something and they're getting a semi-punishment for missing their session. Uh, but I try and do everything with humour and uh, have a great time, have a great experience. So then that client will always... <laughs> That client will always come back to you. And I've had clients with me. My longest client is 25 years. Okay? So doing the job that you love means that, in my opinion, if you do the job that you love, it shouldn't be overly stressful. It shouldn't be a pain to wake up in the morning. It shouldn't be something that drags you down it should be something that pushes you and makes you want to be the best of the best so i think there's five or six level fives in london at my standard so it's very low amount of us doing it which is great so i'm pleased that i did my six years does that make sense Whereas if you do NASM, uh, ACSM and all these other courses and online stuff and the YMCA, everybody's got that qualification. So that means when you do the Czech Institute studying, you're setting yourself out to be a part and to be different and to look at things in a in a different way. And or even the Parlequin work. So one of my really good friends, he studied a lot of Charles Parlequin and a bit of Paul Czech. He's really successful and uh, he said that the other courses were under par compared to Charles's and Paul's courses. Does that make sense? But this is only if you want to be doing your job in 10 years time that you should commit to six years. Does that make sense? Or commit to a, a certain amount of time of learning and studying and all that stuff. And what do you got to remember in the fitness industry? There's many cowboys that do one course to get that certificate and then they don't even know how to do a postural assessment or they don't even know how to write a proper program. And I can tell you there's hundreds of trainers like this because I get clients to me and the first thing I say to them, have you worked with a trainer before? Uh, yes. Are you still working with him now? No, I'm not working with him because we had an argument or I've moved on or I've moved to the country or some excuse. Uh, so uh, how long are you working with your trainer for? Oh, I've been working with my trainer for 10 years. Uh, can I see a year's worth of programs, please? Uh, uh, no, he's never written me a program. 
So how can you move the body on in sports performance or getting somebody out of pain or improving something and not write a program? It's completely stupid. I'm 53, I still write down everything I do. So then that way I can track it if I get an injury or I get a niggle or something is not going the way that I want it to, I can track it and find out why. And this is why the trainers that are not giving their clients programs are really ripping you off or they're ripping their clients off. Does that make sense? So I hope you've enjoyed this video, 30 minutes long. Please comment down below. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please like and share. Uh, I'm now up to 725 TikTok followers. So if you want to check out my TikTok and my Instagram, uh, I try and post stuff nearly every couple of days because uh, it's something you have to do now, which is a pain in the ass, but you've got to do it. And uh, I hope you're having a great day. And if you're new to PT or you're thinking of becoming a PT, remember, it's not easy. And it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Speak to you again soon. 18 inches, come on! <laughs>